we are in week three of a series called 2020, and, and we've been talking about how do I get a clear vision, how do I recognize and respond to God's voice uh, in, in the things that he's doing and, and, and see what God is doing and then join him with it. We talked about recognizing and responding in worship, recognizing and responding uh, in life groups and living free. Now let's talk about recognizing and responding as we serve. And let me start with a question. Do you know that you're called? This is not just a ministry thing. Uh, I'm not saying everyone here is called a full-time ministry, but every single person is called. There's this idea out there uh, of the five-fold ministry calling, and it's the idea that everyone is called to uh, different specific things. We're wired differently. We're wired uniquely, but we're all called uh, as part of this five-fold calling. You have one of these things that's more uh, blatantly obvious in your personality. This comes from Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 11. Start with verse 11. This will be up on the screen. It says this, Now, these are the gifts Christ gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. And that's where you usually go, ha ha, not me. I'm not any of those. Uh, uh, Au contraire. Uh, (laughs) Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So the idea here is that every single human being has a calling in your life, whether you're in ministry, full-time or not, uh, that one of these five areas more naturally resonates with your heart. For instance, the apostle. Uh, This is someone who's visionary. Uh, If you tend to push for new territory in your life, you tend to want to get ahead, move on to the next big thing. If you find yourself in church asking the question, are we leading God's people to their destiny? Are we helping people become who God made them to be and grow in their faith and do those things? You might have this apostle spirit. Then there's prophet. And a lot of people are, oh, I'm, not, I'm definitely not that one, because we think that's all about like telling the future or whatever, seeing things. Really, a prophet can see the big picture when others don't. So if you tend to be a kind of person who could take all the pieces and go, you know, here's the patterns I see, here's the big picture, you may have this. You, if you find yourself asking uh, the question we're asking, are, are people not only recognizing but responding to God's voice? What is God calling people to do? You might have a little bit of prophet uh, spirit. E- evangelists, these are the people gatherers. You know the word, you can make the word relevant to others, and you tend to ask yourself this question, are new people entering the kingdom of God because of what we're doing? Are people coming to Christ? You care about that. If you care about that, you probably have an evangelist spirit. Pastor, uh, some of you are pastors in here in that a pastor is a shepherd of God's people. You tend to empathize with people, you have real patience for those in need, and, and you find yourself asking the question, Are we showing the compassion of God to the world around us? Are we loving people like Christ loves them? If you care about that, you might have the pastor's spirit. Then there's teacher. The teacher is one who holds forth the truth. You explain it. Uh, You're able to help others understand it. You care about the question, are people getting into God's word? Are people learning and growing and, and, and getting into the word of God? You might have a teacher's spirit. The point is, We're all called. The question I want to ask is, do we hear that call? When we talk about worship free and live free, it's about seeing God at work, recognizing where he's working, and then responding in worship or responding, uh, what's he saying in his word and what am I supposed to do with it? Serve free is actually all about hearing. So when when you sense that nudge in your spirit and God gives you direction in your life about how you'll spend your time or whether you should care for someone in need or or that type of thing. People have a tendency to listen only to what we want to hear. We've all heard that saying, listen to your heart. Sounds so right. Oh, just just listen to your heart. The problem is Jeremiah 17 says the heart's deceitfully wicked above all things. That ain't so good, right? In fact, when God does get a hold of your heart, Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, guard your heart for it's the wellspring of life. In other words, there are hundreds of things competing for our attention, and in the midst of it, all through Scripture, God is saying, hey, listen to me. Listen to my voice. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, the Shema, uh, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. We see it in Jeremiah 10, 1, hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O Israel. John 10, 27, my sheep, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Mark 4, 9. Then he said, anyone with ears, do you have ears? Okay, just checking. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. 
God wants us to listen, to hear his voice and to respond and to follow his call for our lives. My, my thought is this, the problem isn't our lack of call, the problem is our inability to hear the voice of God. Is that fair? So turn with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 2. If you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 164. As always, if you didn't bring a Bible, raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one, and if you don't own it, keep it. It's our gift to you. But 1 Samuel chapter 2, page 164. This is a story of Eli, priest of God, his two rebellious sons, and a young man named Samuel who teaches us what it looks like to hear the voice of God and then respond to his calling. So 1 Samuel chapter 2, page 164, starting with verse 12. And it starts like this. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. Whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, Eli's sons would send over a servant with a three-pronged fork. While the meat of the sacrificed animal was still boiling, the servant would stick the fork into the pot and demand that whatever it brought up be given to Eli's sons. All the Israelites who came to worship at Shiloh were treated this way. Sometimes the servant would come even before the animal's fat had been burned on the altar. He would demand raw meat before it had been boiled so that it could be used for roasting. The man offering the sacrifice might reply, take as much as you want, but the fat must be burned first. Then the servant would demand, no, give it to me now or I'll take it by force. So the sin of these young men was very serious in the Lord's sight, for they treated the Lord's offerings with contempt. So let me paint a scenario, because you're probably not necessarily up on Old Testament sacrificial law. Uh, what you've got to understand here is that there are all these rules and regulations for how you sacrifice an animal, how you did it, when you did it, where you did it, the timing of everything, when the priest could eat it. It was all lined up. Eli's sons know this, and they're completely ignoring God. They're ignoring the rules and regulations for what they could eat, and, and they disregarded everything. They did whatever they want. They said, I don't really care what God said. I want my steak. I want to grill it up. I need a little marbling on the side, right? It's going to be delicious. I don't really care what God says. And here's the worst part. Eli knew. Their father knew about this. In 1 Samuel 2, verse 22. Now, Eli, I love this. Eli was very old. But he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. Translation, he was old, but he wasn't senile. Okay? He's not, he knows what's going on here. He can see it. And you need to see this. Don't miss this. Eli hears the voice of God, but he doesn't listen to it. D don't miss that. He recognizes what God is saying, what he's supposed to do. He just chooses not to respond. Now, you might say, why would you do that? Well, there are hundreds of reasons, but what it boils down to for Eli is that in this moment, he chooses his sons over God. He loves his sons more than he loves God. So let me ask you this. What do you love more than God? And by the way, we all have it. What is that thing in your life that you love so much, you place such value on, you so define yourself by that the fear of losing it actually keeps you from listening to God? Maybe it's your reputation. Oh, what would people think if, if what would people think if, if I talked about Jesus? Maybe it's time or money or, or relationships or whatever it is. But whatever it is, it causes you to go, I can't go where God is calling me to go because I'm afraid it will cost me this. We all have it. Okay? For Eli, it was his sons. He loved his sons more than God, so he stopped listening to God. And as you continue to read the story, you see that God, he sends a man of God to Eli that says, hey, you think you tried to save your sons, you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose your sons, you're going to lose your priesthood, you're going to lose your life. So here's, here's the point. There is a cost to listening to God, but it doesn't compare to the cost of not listening. There is a cost to listening to God, but it does not compare to the cost of not listening. When you choose to not listen to God, eventually you forget his voice. If you can't recognize that God is speaking, you'll never respond accordingly. And if you never respond when God speaks, eventually he just stops talking. Now, contrast this with Samuel. Let's pick it up in 1 Samuel 2, verse 35. Then I will raise up a faithful priest who will serve me. Now, by the way, that priest is Samuel, okay? This is the book of 1 Samuel, not the book of 1 Eli's naughty sons, okay? 
Uh, this is First Samuel. He says, Then I'll raise up a faithful priest who will serve me and do what I desire. I will establish his family, and they will be priests to my anointed kings forever. So today I want to look at the story of Samuel and three keys to responding in service to God. So let's pick it up in First Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. So here's where I want to start out for those of you who like to take notes. Number one, we need to be able to recognize his voice, to, to recognize the voice of God. A little background on Samuel. His mother Hannah was barren. She could not have children, and she begged God, God, would you just give me a son? Would you give me a child? I will give him back to you. And God blesses her and gives her a son, and she does. When he's just a small boy, she brings him to the temple to serve with Eli. He's been there for quite a while. And so this reference to the boy, Samuel, isn't like you know three or four. Uh, the historian Josephus thinks he's probably about 12 at the time. And he is Samuel's apprentice, his errand boy, his lackey. Okay. Now it says the word of the Lord was rare. What you need to understand is there was no reason for Samuel to expect God to speak. That, that just wasn't happening. During this entire season, there were only two prophets that heard from God. Only five messages were shared, not one of them good. People just weren't listening for the voice of God because he wasn't speaking. And so Samuel has no expectation that God would speak, and he has no reason to even be listening. So that's what's going on. Pick it up, verse 2. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. The, the, the picture here, the lamp that he's talking about, is the golden lampstand in the holy place. And part of Samuel's job in the temple was to keep this thing lit during the day and stuff. So by, the fact that it's still lit gives us a timetable, tells us it was probably 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Pick it up, verse 4. Suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel, this is important. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he never had a message from the Lord before. So Samuel doesn't know God's voice. Now, let, let's just point out that the kid lived at church. Okay? You think you had to be there a lot as a kid? He wins. Okay? He lives there. His whole life is about going through the motions. His life is filled with the things of God, but he does not know the voice of God. By the way, what about you? Right? Maybe your parents made you go to church when you were growing up. I was there every time the doors were open. Maybe that was your life. I went to Sunday school. I've seen the flannel graph, okay? Uh, I, I was in my church youth group. I was a leader in my youth group. Fantastic. How's the voice of God sound? Here's my point. Just because you grew up in his house doesn't mean you know his voice, right? Just because you grew up going to church doesn't mean you know how to hear the voice of God. Now, my kids have selective hearing, okay? Is this just me? I don't think it is. If you're a parent... I have a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old. I can leave in the morning and okay, I can say, okay, okay, here's your list of chores. You need to practice a piano, read, clean your room. Notice I'm numbering these. Go in this order. Notice I'm writing them down. Here's the list. You, you need to do these things. Then you can have a snack. Then you need to take care of the dog and do the dishes, and then you can watch Netflix. Do you, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Let's shake. Let's make eye contact, right? This is a contract, binding, right? I come home, and the room's a mess, and the dog is barking, and there's dirty dishes. Did you practice? No. Did you read? Well, uh, no. But I, I, I made you a list. I was here. I know you were here because I was here. I saw you. We agreed. We shook hands. What happened? And you know what they say? I didn't hear you, right? Now, pause. They did have a snack and watch Netflix. That they managed to do. They didn't miss that part, right? Here's my point. Now, listen, I have great kids. They're really obedient. But my point is this. There's a difference between hearing and listening, isn't there? Now, one of the problems with the church 
is we hear the Word of God all the time. We just don't listen to it. We're familiar with the Bible. We come, we hear it preached, but we're not really listening. So we tend to skip over certain parts or miss others. And the Word of the Lord is very rare. But it's not because He's not speaking. It's because we're not listening. See, just because you can't hear and see God doesn't mean He's not speaking. Ransom, we're always calling you to get involved. Uh, probably to a fault. Some people are like, man, when are you going to lay off that? Um, never. Um, <laughs> We talk about worship free, live free, serve free, and we've been in this 11 week My Ransom initiative. I'm wearing the shirt, folks, right? 11 week, and it's not a campaign like, let's get people to serve, let's get people involved. It's a campaign to help you understand you are the church. You're the hands and feet of Christ, which means if God called you here to this church, you have something to do, you have a call, and it's to give you ownership of that understanding. You're called to learn with us, to grow with us. So if you're sitting here after 11 weeks of us saying, you got to worship free, live free, serve free. If you're sitting here after 11 weeks and you're going, I wonder how I get involved here. Is it safe to say you're not listening? Is that fair? Can we go there? Right? So here we have to recognize his voice. That's where it starts. Okay. Second, we need to be receptive to his call. Not just recognize it, but to actually receive it. Let's pick it up, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 8. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again, and if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed, and the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak, for your servant is listening. So there was this high school music appreciation class. And it was high school, so as you can imagine, not everybody in the class appreciated it, (laughs) right? Uh, And the teacher was trying to get the class to understand, and she said, hey, did you know there's a difference between listening and hearing? What's the difference between listening and hearing? Nobody answered. Finally, after a little while, a girl stuck up her hand, and, and, and she shared an insight that just changed the whole class. She said this, listening is wanting to hear. Listening is wanting to hear. Samuel had to want to hear. Three times God woke Samuel up, just with a little nudge, nothing big. He just, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. And it wasn't until Samuel said, speak, your servant's listening that God revealed his call. Listen, have you ever said that to God? God's nudging your heart about something. You watch the Safe Families video and your heart goes, oh, hello. But you have to be receptive. You have to say, God, what does that mean for me? What, what do you want from me? What do you have for me? Until we're receptive, until we're willing to risk everything to listen for the sake of God's call, we'll never hear his voice. He'll never reveal his will for us. Listen, we all like to plan, don't we? Even those of you who are laid back, you make plans, you, like you plan to do nothing all the time, right? You say, I'm not doing anything. Uh, but we all like to plan, even if you're laid back. We plan for our careers, don't we? We, plan for, we, we make wedding plans and, and, and we make uh, retirement plans. We have daily routines that we really like. And, and when those routines get interrupted, we get frustrated. You know, uh, I, I know I do. Um, but often God has to interrupt us in order to get our attention. So many in this My Ransom Challenge we've had conversations and the conversation goes like this. I really, I really want to be in a life group. I just don't have time. I really want to serve. I just, I can't fit it in. Fit it into what? Listen, I don't care if you get in a life group or serve, but I want you to hear this. When God calls, he interrupts. Okay. His call is this, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me daily. Okay. If he's calling us to deny ourselves, I don't think he really cares about our calendar, our schedule, right? He's not going, oh, I'd really like Phil to go on that mission trip, but ooh, he just can't fit it in, right? When God calls you to go to Zambia or Mexico and build a home, he interrupts your life to do it. This whole safe families thing, my wife and I made the mistake with this safe families thing of going, we'll just dip our toe in the water, Right? We, we said, let's just go to the meeting. It's just informational. 
God starts wrecking our hearts and doing all this stuff. And, and so we say, well, we'll just be a respite family. That, that just means that when the regular, real, like con- committed host family can't keep them, we'll take the baby for the weekend. That's not so bad, right? We're just dipping our toe into water. Guess what happened? Now we're adopting. And I'm old. And my dreams of lofts, loft apartments and motorcycles are gone. And I'm so happy. Because listen, when God calls, he will interrupt your life. He, he's not going to call you to serve with our loop ministry and, and volunteer in the nursing home or the hospital or the prison without interrupting your life. If he calls you to kids ministry, and guess what? He's calling some of you. And if you just went, ooh, that was probably you. And, and he's not going to call you to kids ministry. This is just a little, little known fact. You can't be in two places at once. Which means if you're going to serve in the kids ministry, you have to be here Two services. <gasps> and the restaurants will still be open when you get done. Right? We're going to have to come early. We're going to have to stay late. We're going to have to give more. Oh, my goodness. And it'll be the best thing ever because guess what? The life you're holding on to ain't that good. And giving your life away is. But you've got to let go. You cannot do this without God wrecking your life? Are you ready to get wrecked? That's really the question. Recognizing God's voice is pointless if you're not receptive to it. Samuel went on to be priest and prophet and judge over Israel, but it started with a young boy in the temple being quiet enough to listen and then saying, whatever you want, God, speak, for your servant is listening. So we've got to recognize, we've got to receive. And then number three, this is the hardest one. Listen, we must respond no matter what. Let's pick it up, verse 11. Samuel has just said to God, speak for your servant is listening. This is where the good part comes, right? God's going to give me something really awesome to do. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do a shocking thing in Israel. I am going to carry out all my threats against Eli and his family from beginning to end. I've warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God and he hasn't disciplined them. So I have vowed that the sins of Eli and his sons will never be forgiven by sacrifices or offerings. Whoa. So there was this guy who was in the hospital and he was very, very sick. And, uh, they did a bunch of tests, and then they did that thing where they call the, the spouse into the other room. May we have a private conversation? So the wife goes in there, and the doctor sits her down. He says, I got bad news, and I got good news. The bad news is your husband's got about two weeks to live, okay? The good news is if you can change some things, it's treatable. Like, he can recover. Your husband's immune system is very weak, so here's the scenario. You have to clean the house every day. It has to be spotless. He needs food. He needs strength. So you need to make him three home-cooked meals every day plus snacks, and he can't get up. So you're going to have to wait on him hand and foot. If you can do these things, he'll live. Do you understand? And the wife said, yes, I understand. Do you want to tell him or do you want me to? She said, I'll tell him. So she went into the next room where the husband was, and he looked at her. He said, it's bad, isn't it? She said, what did the doctor say? The doctor said, you're going to die. (laughs) Right? Some of you are like, wait, what? Oh, okay. Uh, Because listen, it doesn't matter what your call is if you're not willing to live it out. And guess what? We're doing that to our neighbors all the time. When you refuse to serve where God called you, you know what you're saying to your neighbors, your work coworkers? You're saying, it's bad. You're going to die. And there's nothing I can do about it. And it's just not true. Listen, this call came with some tough details, didn't it? Samuel's given a message from God directly against Eli and his family. This is his mentor. This is the guy who raised him. He knew it was going to hurt Eli. He didn't want to share the message. Okay? He didn't like this call very much. Look at verse 15. Samuel stayed in bed until morning, then got up and opened the doors of the tabernacle as usual. He was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord had said to him. Okay? Obedience to God's call isn't easy. It says that Samuel stayed in bed. He slept in. I would too. I don't want to get up and share this message. You've got to understand the situation. Can you imagine being in Samuel's shoes? He's 12 years old, and he has to go tell his mentor, by the way, God's going to wipe you and your whole family out. 
Whatever he's calling you to, I don't even know what it is, it's not this bad. The truth is, though, God's call will challenge you. It just will. I cannot say what the challenge will be. I just know he has a role he wants you to play in your workplace, in your family, in your community, in your local church, to be part of his plan to bring about the transformation of the kingdom of God on earth. You are part of that call. When we begin to think ministries for pastors were mistaken, my job as a pastor is not to minister to you. My job is to teach you to minister. That's our call, to equip you for ministry. If this is your church, you're a minister of the church. If you call this your home church, you have a part to play in worship free, live free, serve free. Maybe you've been ignoring that. Maybe God's calling you to Harrisburg. Every time you hear Harrisburg mentioned, you're like, ah. I don't want to, but you know you're supposed to go. Maybe he's calling you to kids' ministry. I know that's happening. Brand new kids' area downstairs. You can check it out today. Maybe you're going to be walking through it, and he's going to go, you need to be here. You need to be here. Will you listen to that? Maybe he's calling you to tech team. Maybe he's calling you to be an usher or a greeter or an office volunteer. Maybe he's calling you to go to that safe families thing. You watch a video and you're like, I ain't going to that meeting. That's probably a sign that you need to go to that meeting, right? Because we wrestle with this. Here, here's my point. God's call, whatever it is, will be inconvenient, okay? He will not fit it into your schedule. He will not consider your agenda. He will not look at what's a priority to you. He will not ask what it costs you. Because whatever it costs you, it costs less than it costs his son. The cross was not convenient. The reason God's voice is rare is not because he's not calling us. It's because we're not listening. And I think the reason we're not listening is because we're afraid of what it'll cost. Uh, an anonymous person put it this way. Most people wish to serve God, but in an advisory capacity only. Doesn't work that way. There's only one manager and it isn't you. So if you don't hear anything else, hear this. If you want to live like Christ, you better get used to inconvenient. If you want to, if you want to live a Christ-like life, you better get used to inconvenient. Dr. B.J. Miller puts it this way. He says, it's a great deal easier to do that which God gives us to do, no matter how hard it is, than to face the responsibilities of not doing it. What does obedience look like to you? God is, how's God calling you to live at work, in your family, at your church? How's he calling you to live? God has planted us in a certain place for a certain time. He's got a plan on your life, and he expects you to be faithful where you are, in your family, in your life, with your neighbors, with your coworkers, in your vocation, at your church. And if God's called you to this church... He's called you to worship free, live free, serve free. You just have. And if you have engaged that, great. If not, ask yourself, why not? Look, look at Samuel's life. 1 Samuel 3.19, it says, As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. So here's what I want you to hear today. God wants to make you a Samuel. He wants to touch your life in a way. He wants to use your obedience to impact the world around you. But it starts with your willingness to receive, to hear the call, to receive it and say, speak for your servant is listening, and then to carry it out no matter what. Is it not true in America we've made church about us? I mean, is that not fair? Like somehow, somewhere along the line, it became us about, about us and not him. And so now church is about comfort, not call. But the church is all about call, right? And we live in a world desperate for Jesus Christ. And we have him, and we're looking him in the face and going, nothing I can do. No, it's just not true. It's just not true. So if you're here, if you hear the things that we preach in this place on Sunday, and you're not called to serve God, you're not listening. Right? We got to hear God's voice. We got to hear his call. So if you're in R3 group, this is a question you're going to wrestle with this week. If you're not in an R3 group, I still want you to wrestle in your own soul with it. God is speaking. Are you listening? And if not, why not? Are you just having a hard time understanding what it means to hear his voice? Are you being receptive? Are you, are you hearing it, just ignoring? You're actually not responding? My prayer is you wrestle with this. My prayer is you get ready for, for life groups. My prayer is you 
wrestle with this in your own soul, is that God would make you a Samuel. He would make you someone who says, God, whatever you want, I'm listening. Let me pray for you. So Heavenly Father, would you start with me? Would you make me a better Samuel? There are times that I hear your voice and I just, to be honest, I just try to ignore it. I try to, I try to pretend you're not saying what you're saying and yet your call is clear and, and I pray that you would, you would help me be receptive, that you would help me hear your voice first of all, you would help me say to you, speak God, whatever you want, I'm your servant. I'll do what you call me to do. I'll be who you call me to be. God, for the mistaken notion that so many Christians li- live with that I'm, I accepted Christ, I'm saved, I'm good. That's like, I'm good, that's all God has for me. It's just not true. He says, I have plans for you. They give you a hope and a future. God, would you, would you help us hear that call? Would you help us recognize and respond to the voice of God in a way that changes us forever, I pray? In your name, amen.